talk about the River Bush, um, and I have to come and speak about a single river system now after listening to, to Eric's presentation, so forgive me. Um, we have the great benefit in Northern Ireland of a very long-term data series on our index river. We have 40 to 50 years of, of, of smolt data and adult data from our, our core monitoring river. And I want to tell you the story about the smolt run on the river bush uh, this afternoon. And hopefully along the way, we'll, we'll maybe have a few observations uh, about our, our, our stock that are of use, of interest, uh, and of, uh, of use to the conference. So the, uh, the Bush Station was established in the early 1970s. Uh, it was built around a series of fish traps. We have adult traps that intercept the adults moving upstream. and We have a series of smolt traps uh, which intercept the, the young fish moving downstream. Uh, we also have long-term biological information on, on all these uh, fish that uh, go through our traps. In addition to that, we have aquaculture facilities at Bush Mills, which are really useful. They allow us to produce uh, ranched fish, and we can follow their fortunes in addition to the wild fish. So here we are. The River Bush is on the north coast of Northern Ireland. And in actual fact, when you look at it there, we're, we're, we're probably, the mouth of our river is probably closer to Scotland than, than it is to Belfast. Okay, here we are. This is the bush catchment. It's a medium-sized spit river, 67 kilometers long. Um, the upper parts of the catchment are characterized by pretty good nursery habitat. We have a lot of uh, nice... Uh, nursery habitat for juvenile trout and salmon. But then we move into the agricultural dominated um, meandering sort of lowland portion of the river and in these areas the, rivers, the river has been impacted by historical drainage schemes. Uh, it then flows down towards the salmon station at Bush Mills where we have our, our station and where the traps are located and then finally flows directly into the North Atlantic at the Bush Bay. So that's our river. In terms of our smolt program, we have a complete census of smolts through uh, our, our series of traps. We count everything. We try and account for absolutely every fish that comes down the river. And I think we're, we're very fortunate to have that quality of data. We also have information on, on each cohort in terms of their biological characteristics. Um, and we run, we run a coded wire microtagging program. Historically, we, we coded wire tagged about 10% of the, the wild run, uh, but since the coastal fisheries have now been discontinued, that, that works discontinued, and we only microtag hatchery fish. So here's the Riverbush Station. For those of you that, that haven't been there, our station's located here in the town of Bush Mills. Um, we have a weir at the top of our facility. This weir diverts water and smolts off the main river into a side channel and, and disgorges them into our, our smolt trap. We have a series of sluices just downstream of the weir so we can control flows when the, 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 the discharge in the river increases. And in actual fact, when we lose control and uh, we, we have a really big flood in the river, we actually have overspill traps then built into the structure of the weir so that we can we can figure out exactly what has, has crossed over the weir. So uh, here's the setup. This is the uh, overflow um, channel. It takes the fish down into the trap. Here's the trap. Uh, and you can see our smolt counting facilities are located in a small building, which is really good at night time or in, in rough weather. We get a bit of comfort. OK, here we have the uh, smolt counts on the bush from the mid-1970s until, uh, until recently. And you can see here on this data that uh, there's effectively uh, two periods of time. From the mid-1970s through until the mid-1990s, there was a general decline in terms of smolt production on the bush. It went from around 30,000 smolts down to a low point in 1995 when we only had 5,000 smolts picked up at the trap. Uh, at that point in time, the department um, were made the decision to change their management regime. Up until 95, 
All we did in the bush was monitor. It was a monitoring situation. We counted all the fish being produced. We found, counted all the fish coming back from the ocean. That was it. Hands-off approach. After the low smolt runs in the early 1990s, the department took the decision to actively engage in more management and see if we could build the smolt run up. And in recent times, the smolt run now is approaching historical levels of abundance. It's a good news story for us in that we're back up to, to levels of around about 30,000 smolts again. And during the monitoring phase, we came to understand that there were quite a lot of issues that limited smolt production and survival on the bush. Key among these were, were habitat problems. We have an invasive um, species, uh, an aquatic weed that wasn't indigenous to the bush, water crowfoot. It came in in the 1960s, I think, after the drainage scheme. It was introduced to try and enhance the habitat, but the, the net effect was that it, it, it overgrew a lot of our spawning areas and, and reduced suitability of, 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 of uh, reproductive habitats. Um, I guess everybody has, has this issue, re reduced marine survival, and we particularly noticed it on, on the bush. It's been quite pernicious with us. And lastly, but by no means least, predation was, was, was seen to be a bit of a, a, an issue for us at Bush Mills. Um, just a slide to show you how uh, the, the water crowfoot has colonised and overgrown some of our spawning habitats. Here's a, 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 a spawning ford at Stranocum, a very, very good spawning ford, and it's completely carpeted in water crowfoot, so much so that um, the fish actually have difficulty cutting through the, 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 the thallus of the weed to uh, deposit eggs. Um, I'm going to take you back to the, 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 the map of the bush catchment again. I'm just going to point this time to a little island that sits off the coast of the bush catchment. This is Sheep Island. It's known locally as uh, um, uh, an important breeding colony for cormorants. And it's located right uh, adjacent to the, to the bush catchment. And we know that a lot of birds uh, would overfly the bush catchment particularly during the, the, the spring months, um, and, and would tend to, to drop in and uh, avail of our smolts. Now, we know as well that uh, work that my predecessor, Gershom Kennedy, did uh, back in the 1980s, that the, smolt num uh, the, the, the cormorant numbers on Sheep Island increased exponentially through the 1970s and into the 1980s, up to an excess of 400 um, breeding pairs on the island at that time. And Gershom, back in the 80s, uh, just to review quickly the work he did, indicated that uh, cormorant predation was a particularly um, big problem for us locally on the bush. At that time, they, they undertook uh, some daily surveys of cormorants through the 1986 smolt run. They shot some birds and looked at the, the gut contents. Uh, and from that work, they estimated that in early May, up to 300 birds per day were potentially feeding in the catchment, with an estimated total daily predation rate of between 600 to 1,200 smolts. And the net effect of that was that it, the predation rate could potentially be taking 50% of the smolt production from the river. Um, after the um, monitoring phase, the department actively engaged in management. Um, a number of issues were, a number of schemes were introduced. We have uh, habitat improvement schemes to try and augment uh, drained habitat. Uh, we have a weed management plan. We try and remove weed from some of the key spawning areas on a regular basis. There was some experimental stocking work undertaken, and we reported on that a couple of years ago at the conference in, in Glasgow. Uh, and lastly, we have a predation management plan on the river as well. Every year, the department uh, have a license to cull up to 30 birds uh, that are feeding on the, on, on the bush. The, 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 I guess the sort of ethos behind this is not so much to, to kill birds, but to have staff on the ground early in the smolt run and early in the day when the, when the birds are coming in inland to feed, to shoot, uh, but also to scare birds and try and prevent them from f forming the feeding habit with us on the bush. So that's been going on for 25 years. And you can see some photographs of, of, of habitat enhancement work here. Uh, 
before, after enhancement on a drain section and some gravel cleaning going on as well. But despite the fact that the smolt run has increased towards historical levels of abundance, this is our big problem. You can see the black uh, graph here shows the returns of grills to the coast. So this is pre-fishery abundance estimates back to the river bush from the smolt run. And you can see that although the smolt runs increased, grills production has, has decreased fairly steadily throughout the last 25 years. And this is something we've been very interested in trying to understand and trying to get, get a handle on. Why, why has this sort of mismatch, if you like, occurred? And one of, the, one of the things that we are particularly interested in Bush Mills is seeing if changing conditions in fresh water might be having some sort of influence on post-smolt smolt and post-smolt survival um, and performance. Now, we've heard some other uh, speakers this morning talk about changing um, uh, movement patterns during smolt runs. And on the bush, we have definitely seen a shift, a shift towards earlier smolt runs. Seems to be that across the, the, the period of time, the smolt run has shifted uh, or about maybe three to five days per decade from the 1970s until more recent times. And here you can see in this box and whisker chart the, the date by which 25%, 50%, and 75% of the smolt run has emigrated through the bush traps. So it's getting earlier. We think it's, it's linked with, with warmer springs. And it seems to be particularly prevalent for the earlier running fish. Now we heard earlier on folks talking about um, earlier running fish being bigger, being older, uh, and certainly we, we see that uh, uh, at the bush trap. Most of our early smolts uh, that come, come in April tend to be, to be older, larger fish. And if you look at um, the date by which 25% of the annual smolt run has gone through the traps at bush mills, you can see that it is very, very definite clear trend towards an earlier smolt run from mid-May and so some years towards the 20th of, of April. This is particularly prevalent for the bigger fish. If you compare that uh, chart uh, in terms of the first quartile of the smolt run against the T5 temperature, uh, T5 temperature, I think it's the first date at which the river has experienced five days above 10 degrees Celsius. So we use it as a convenient metric to describe how rapidly or how quickly the river is warming up each year. So we have the, the, these data, we're able to compare them, and you can see that there's a, there's a fairly good correlation between these two data sets. You'll notice in recent years we've had two years where we've had pretty cold winters and cool springs. 2010 and 2013 were both, both fairly cool winters, and interestingly, in both these years, the smolt run reverted back a little bit and, and, and got later. So temperature seems to be a very important driver for us on the river bush. Now the interesting thing from our point of view in our locality, where we are, is that the fish that are going earlier, uh, this, this sort of first 25 percentile, seem to be experiencing relatively warm conditions in the river, relatively cool conditions in the sea. We're seeing an increasing thermal mismatch between river temperature and marine temperatures, particularly for these early running smolts. This, we think, may put them at a disadvantage. Uh, potentially, they're, 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 they're leaving warm river into a cool sea, and particularly because of the unique, um, the, the unique circumstances we have uh, on the river bush. Because you see, we've got no estuary. Our river flows across a steep, stony beach straight into the North Atlantic. And you can go and you can stand here with a temperature probe in the middle of the smolt run and maybe pick up 13 or 14 degrees Celsius, walk 20 yards down the beach, and you're maybe into 8 degrees. It's a big change in a very short spatial um, uh, extent. And I think it's no, it's no wonder then that one of the prime places for spotting cormorants on the bush is here, right here in the junction between the two environments. 
this is just another uh, quick uh, overhead view of, of, the, of the river and this, this sort of problematic area that we, we hypothesize that we lose a lot of fish in. We also know there's been some chat this morning about uh, smolt size and the impact that has on subsequent survival and, and we, we certainly see this on the bush as well. These data are um, for hatchery produced smolts and they show marine survival for two-year-old hatchery smolts and one-year-old hatchery smolts raised on the bush um, aquaculture facility. And by and large, the two plus smolts have about twice the survival rate as the one plus smolts. In the wild stock, we see a very definite pattern uh, in terms of smolt age and growth return. Our two plus smolts are completely and utterly overrepresented in the growth return. So the bigger, older smolts are producing these grills, exactly the point Neil's made earlier on. Now, we have a sort of a weak signal to suggest that the, the one plus smolts produce multi sea winter fish by and large. However, on the bush, 95% of our run are grills. So what happens to the grills has a really big uh, implication for our stock. And we think that these two-year-old fish are having a particularly hard time in recent, in recent years. Now, these data are, are just um, more sort of short-term data uh, in, ter in terms of percentage returns to fresh water by one sea winter and multi sea winter salmon. An interesting thing here is that in the medium to short term, you can see that there's been a decline, fairly marked decline, in one sea winter returns, whereas, if anything, the multi sea winter fish are doing a little bit better. They seem to be um, performing uh, in an upward trend. So, all this um, um, sort of theorizing about our older fish, about thermal mismatch, about the problems of, of survival for, for two and three plus smolts, led us to, to try and do a little bit of, of, of field work to actually follow some smolts, follow some of these larger smolts over the course of, of, of a smolt run and see what was happening to them in the river. So we set up a project using acoustic telemetry to try and follow a batch, a representative batch, of, of larger smolts. Um, two objectives to this study. First one was to look at the behaviour, timing and survival of smolts after release from upstream rearing habitats from the headwaters on the bush out to coastal waters. The second one was then to really focus in on what happened to the fish at this uh, transitioning point between fresh water and salt water. So uh, we used acoustic seven millimeter uh, VEMCO tags. Uh, under um, ASPA license, we implanted these into larger smolts, 15 and a half centimeter fish, into the, the peritoneal cavity. We set up a range of uh, acoustic receivers throughout the, the river, and we released fish at two separate release locations in 2014. And just want to say thanks to Matt Newton, who helped us out with this and uh, give us a wee bit of an insight, because I think it was the first time we'd, we'd work with this. So cheers, Matt. OK, so here you can see the um, location of the acoustic array that we put out in the river. The little red dots indicate receivers. Uh, we, we tagged 12 fish in the headwaters, we tagged 28 fish at the trap. The reason we sort of only tagged 12 up at the very headwaters where we were confident we'd lose most of these fish, and because we really wanted to see what was going to happen when the fish transitioned into the sea, we, we, we sort of hedged our bets and we did more at the trap so that we were more close to the sea and we'd get a good signal in terms of what happened to the fish between river and sea. We also did a range of, of sweepover surveys using a, a, a portable acoustic receiver to try and pick up any tags that had, had perhaps disappeared, potentially removed by predators. So here's a, a quick um, slide to show the location of the receivers that we put into the sea uh, at the uh, Bush Bay. Two headlands off the mouth of the river Bush and we had a, a semicircle of four receivers set around the bay. We did range tests with the tags. We had about 300 meters detection, and we ensured that the, the, the receivers had overlapping 
uh, detection field so that we would maximise the chances of picking fish up that actually made it out into the deeper waters offshore. We had a receiver at the bottom of the river. We, we also stuck a receiver just past the, 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 this, this area that we were worried about. Unfortunately, this receiver didn't work terribly well because it was too close to the surf zone. It was very noisy. So, you know, we didn't get the, the signals that we expected we would get from it. However, we still got some interesting data. Uh, the batch of fish that we tagged in the headwaters, we caught these using angling. I find angling to be a tremendously good way of getting hold of, of, of good quality smolts. It's very low stress. The guys can strip these in very quickly, small barbless hooks, and uh, seems to be a fantastic way of getting a, a good stress, relatively stress-free sample. Uh, we got loads of good data from these fish. Uh, they crossed a waterfall on their way to the sea, which was, which was brilliant. We got some good data in terms of timing um, uh, at the waterfall, but this is the meat, if you like, from, from, from this particular batch of fish. Twelve were tagged in the headwaters, ran down through the river, and we were astounded because we got 11 of these fish 26 kilometres downstream at the Bushmills traps. We couldn't believe it. We, we expected we would lose at least half of them. We didn't. And out of those 12 fish, nine were, were moved out into the, into the deeper waters. 25% total losses. We, we were surprised by this. We then looked at marine transition in a little bit more detail with the added benefit of the extra 28 smokes we tagged at Bush Mills. And interestingly, of those 20, sorry, 39 fish, we got 28 out past the headland. Losses of around 28%. Again, we were surprised at this. We did lose fish in the transition zone, but potentially not as many as we had first feared. In terms of um, the timing of uh, transition between fresh water and salt, from the smoke trap to the sea, it took about a week. But from the bottom of the river into the tide, it took about seven hours. In fact, some fish transitioned in a matter of minutes, and I think it sort of reinforces Andy's point that these fish are really well pre-adapted to marine life before they, before they leave fresh water. We also noticed that the fish were not entering the sea evenly across the 24-hour clock. Most of the fish were actually entering the sea during the hours of darkness. I think the mean time of, of marine entrance was around about sort of 11 or 12 o'clock at night. So this is probably some sort of adaptation to prevent being eaten by avian predators. Um, and in terms, of, in terms of the detections of all the fish, um, the numbers of all the tagged fish that made it out, picked up on each receiver, most of the fish were picked up on this westward one, which is indicating to us fish are moving off in a westward direction. Our conclusions from this piece of work were that our in-river losses were lower than the previous estimates uh, undertaken by Gershom back in the 1980s, that the river to sea transition, we did lose fish but around about 10%. The transitional behaviour seems to be associated with the hours of darkness, and again, we think this is possibly an adaptation to reduce predation. And I will put the caveat, this is a single year pilot study. It will require future repetition. We hope to do this. Uh, there's great variation, not only in terms of the, the smoke run each year, but even in terms of the physical habitat that these fish are having to, to move through at the bottom of the, of the bush. And we hope, that uh, we're going to have the ability to, 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 to follow up on this. Now, I've just updated a data set here because I've shown you um, some evidence to suggest that we are having a little bit less problem with um, losses in recent years, and we've seen an increase in, in, in smoke production back to historical levels of abundance. These data um, supplied by the Northern Ireland Environment Agency show up to date Cormorant nest counts on Sheep Island, the colony off the, the River Bush, and you can see that there has been a steep decline over the last 10 to 15 years in terms of the number of birds on the island. Potentially, there could be, could be a link here, and it's something that we want to look at a little bit more closely. 
I think it's an interesting observation. Uh, I said that the transitional zone can be a little bit, um, it can change from year to year. There's a lot of variation in it. This is the, uh, the, the, the river to sea juncture in 2006. And you can see that there was a single channel flowing towards the sea, fairly deep. The smokes had a little bit of, of, of refuge in, in terms of the, the depth here um, and uh, could transition fairly easily from, from one environment to the other. Compare that, however, with 2011. It's the same area on the river. And this year, you can see that the, the channel split in two. It's a very dynamic sort of beach environment. So, um, you know, it changes one year to the next. In this particular year, we noticed something we'd never seen before. The water was so shallow, uh, literally a few centimetres as it came into the tide, that the smolts became very obvious on their downstream movement. And I don't know if you can make it out here, but the bottom of the, the, the river this particular year, we had hundreds of seagulls that gathered up and actually stood in the shallow water. And we saw a number of occasions, seagulls actively predating smolts, something we'd, we'd never seen before, but happened in 2011. So it sort of indicates the need to repeat and to, to look at uh, this particular sort of area on a year-to-year -year basis. Just to sort of conclude, um, I think we've been having a, a case study effectively on, on, on the River Bush over the uh, course of this presentation. Um, our smoke runs have increased. It's a good news story for us on the bush. We have evidence for earlier running smolts. We're concerned about these earlier running smolts. We need to do more work to understand what's happening to them. We have some evidence to suggest that uh, smolt losses are lower recently uh, than perhaps was the case back in the 1980s. However, marine survival, marine returns remain stubbornly low on our stock, stubbornly low. And I think we need to understand more and more in terms of what's happening to the smolts beyond the headwaters and into the deep ocean. So, thanks. To a number of folks, thanks to my colleagues in AFBE and the Salmon Station, thanks to colleagues in the Department of Agriculture, um, to the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, and also to the North Antrim Angling Association that do a lot of good work on the river. So, folks, thank you for your attention.